The cosmological argument is one of many arguments purporting to prove that a god exists. As an atheist, I don't believe that any god or gods really do exist. If these arguments are valid and sound, then it would mean that atheism is proven to be false, and there's no way I could honestly call myself an atheist. So is the cosmological argument valid and sound? Let's take a look at it and see. There are actually two forms of the argument. The argument from contingency and the Kalam cosmological argument, most famously argued by Christian apologist and philosopher Dr. William Lane Craig. They are both refuted by a similar response, so I'm going to go ahead and just deal with the form of the argument as given by Dr. Craig. It looks something like this. 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. 2. The universe began to exist. 3. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Now, as you may have noted, simply saying that the universe had a cause doesn't mention anything about a god. But Dr. Craig argues further that when we look at the implied attributes of the cause of the universe, that cause looks amazingly like a theistic god, specifically the god of Christianity. These implied attributes are that the cause of the universe must be immaterial, because matter only exists within the universe, atemporal or timeless, because time only exists within the universe, an intelligent being, because of the inherent design and the fine-tuned nature of the universe, and a personal being, because he created humans as intelligent personal beings. Already, the argument runs into a fatal flaw. As YouTuber Qualia Soup so eloquently put in one of my favorite videos, a changeless mind is by definition non-functioning. This means that if there is a being with a mind that exists timelessly, that being cannot think or do anything. Why? Because thinking and doing require change, and change requires time. A timeless being that does anything is a self-contradictory idea, and thus cannot logically exist. So, we could stop our examination of the argument right here and rightfully declare it busted. But let's add insult to injury. Let's go back and look at premises 1 and 2 of the argument above and see if we can't find another reason why this argument fails. Premise 1, everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Premise 2, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. The first thing to note is that the argument in this form doesn't actually show that God exists only that the universe had a cause for its existence. When using this argument, the believer then makes the case that the cause of the universe matches perfectly with the concept of God. Some people criticize the argument for not being rigorous enough to carry this proof all the way through, but that won't be my focus here, because I believe that the argument as given is still fatally flawed. The flaw I see in the Kalam argument is one of equivocation, namely in the idea of beginning to exist. An equivocation is when a word, phrase, or idea is either used in two different ways, or it has two different meanings which aren't recognized in the argument. The argument only appears to be sound because we are tricked into taking one meaning as equal to the other. I'll show exactly how this applies here a bit later. The next thing to notice is why the argument uses the phrase begins to exist at all. There's a reason why proponents of the argument don't simply say that everything has a cause for its existence because that would imply that God himself also has a cause, and we can't have that now, can we? God is supposedly different from everything else in the universe, including the universe itself, because God did not begin to exist, and thus he requires no cause. It seems reasonable and rational to say that things which begin to exist need a cause, doesn't it? Proponents of this argument usually support the first premise by saying that it is simply self-evident. We see things around us all the time coming into existence, and we see their causes as well. My wife and I are the cause of three additional human beings to come into existence, our two daughters and our son, and a practically limitless number of other examples can be found. Now some would argue that quantum physics gives us examples of things coming into existence without a cause, such as the production of virtual particle pairs or the beta decay of neutrons. But whether or not they are truly uncaused is somewhat contentious and require a fair bit of knowledge about quantum mechanics. So for our purposes, we will just go ahead and grant the first premise of the argument because I believe that the argument as given is still fatally flawed. The next thing I would like you to notice is a pattern that all the things that we see in our normal lives which begin to exist share. 
When we say that they begin to exist, it is because we can show a point in time when they did not exist, such as a time before my daughter Latricia was born, and then show a later point in time when they do exist. This is a temporal change, meaning a change that is involved with time. We naturally look for causes for why things change because we wonder why they didn't just continue staying the same. The idea of a cause gives us an explanation for the change from non-existence to existence. We might then ask ourselves, what is the opposite of beginning to exist? What does it mean for something to exist that didn't begin? The immediate and somewhat naive response would be to say that the thing has been around forever, meaning an infinite amount of time. The problem with this is that the proponents of the Kalam argument assure us that it is impossible for time to go infinitely far into the past. You cannot traverse an actual infinity of moments, they argue, because we would never be able to get to now. Besides the fact that if time could go far, infinitely far into the past, so could the universe itself, as time is part of the universe, and thus their argument would be defeated already. So clearly, this isn't the case, even for things which did not begin to exist. Not even God could have existed forever, in the sense of an infinite amount of time, if we can't have an actual infinite amount of time in the past. Instead, it is more correct to use words like eternal, atemporal, or timeless when speaking of such things. Something that exists eternally is something that has always and will always exist. The word always here meaning at every possible point in time. There is not a single point in time, according to believers, that God did not exist. God has always existed, even though, as we have agreed, this has not been for an infinite amount of time. Similarly, we can use the example of other timeless and eternal things. The fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4, for example, has always and will always, as far as we know, be true. This fact is eternal, even though it hasn't been so for an infinite amount of time. It is so at every possible point in time. There is no point in time we can show that 2 plus 2 did not equal 4, and then later began to. So notice again that we have a pattern here. Things which are temporal and begin to exist have the pattern that at some point they did not exist, whereas things which are atemporal and eternal have the pattern that there was no point in time when they did not exist. Their truth is at every possible point in time. These are clearly opposites. So how does the universe fit into all this? Which of these two opposites is the universe more like? The second premise says that the universe began to exist. Proponents of the Kalam argument defend this not only by reasoning that time can't go back infinitely far into the past, so there must have been a beginning point, but that modern cosmology gives the Big Bang as the beginning of the universe some 13.7 billion years ago. Most, if not all, of the popular descriptions of the Big Bang model say that the universe began in a singularity state and expanded to become the universe we see today. Now, it is true that there are other models of the universe which do not require a state of singularity at the Big Bang, or don't place the Big Bang event necessarily as the beginning of the universe. But these models are somewhat contentious and require a fair bit of knowledge about the physics of cosmology. So we'll just go ahead and grant that the universe is only 13.7 billion years old total, just like the proponents of the Kalam argument require. We will do this because I believe that the argument as given is still fatally flawed, and here is where the equivocation that kills the argument is made obvious. The universe, we've agreed, has only existed for a finite amount of time, some 13.7 billion years. And since that time is not infinite, the proponents of the Kalam argument want to call that a beginning. But recall earlier that other eternal and timeless things also have not been around for an infinite amount of time, because an infinite amount of time into the past is supposedly impossible. And yet, we don't say that God began 13.7 billion years ago, do we? Nor do we say that 2 plus 2 began to equal 4 13.7 billion years ago either. All of these things began in the sense that they've only been that way for a finite amount of time, but they don't begin in the sense of premise 1, where there was a point in time when they did not exist or were not true. According to believers, God has always existed at every point in time. The fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4, as far as we know, has always been true at every point in time. And in the exact same way, so has the universe existed at every point in time. Think about that for a minute. The universe has existed at every point in time. 
That has to be true, because time is part of the universe. Time exists within the universe. The universe does not exist within some larger framework of time. To say that there was a point in time when the universe did not exist is like saying that there's a place in the universe where the universe doesn't exist. It's self-contradictory, and self-contradictory things can't be true. So to sum up, there are two kinds of things referred to in the Kalam cosmological argument. Temporal things, which came into existence at some point in time, after not existing at an earlier point in time, and which require causes. And then there are atemporal things, which had no point in time that they did not exist. They exist at all possible points in time. These things do not require a cause, since there was not a change from their non-existence to their existence within time. The fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is part of that latter group. God, if he really exists, would also be part of that latter group. And the universe, necessarily, must also be part of this latter group. The equivocation, which makes the Kalam argument invalid and therefore unsound, is saying that the universe had a beginning just because it is of finite age, even though God and the fact of 2 plus 2 equaling 4 have the exact same finite age. Things which do have causes have a finite age, but they also have a time when they did not exist. Neither God, nor mathematical facts, nor the universe itself have this property. So these eternal things, which have existed at every point in time, don't really begin to exist in the same way that normal temporal things referred to in the first premise do. And so the argument becomes invalid. We can see this a little more directly by rewriting the Kalam argument to better reflect this more precise understanding. Let x equal a thing which begins to exist a finite period of time ago, after a point in time when they did not exist, and let y equal a thing which has existed for a finite period of time, but which has nevertheless existed at every possible point in time. We can then rewrite the Kalam argument as premise 1, everything that is x has a cause for its existence, Premise 2, the universe is Y. Conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. We can see that there is no doubt that this argument is invalid. The argument does not and cannot prove the existence of God as it claims, though it would certainly appear to if we didn't examine things very closely. My atheistic beliefs, it seems, are still rational, at least until we examine the next argument. Remember, don't just swallow it whole. Make sure you chew it up first.